Okay, so I'm Grace. Um, so as occupational therapists, we focus on you know maximizing someone's independence um, and maximizing their function, increasing their safety, quality of life, and just participation in everyday activities. So our role is to kind of take a holistic approach and find out what is important to the patient um, and find ways to help them be successful, do the things that they need and want to do, whether that's you know, making environmental modifications or using adaptive equipment. And so we um, want to help people you know, have a fulfilling life despite having this um, disease that's known to shorten their, their lifespan. And you know, with treatment becoming um, increasingly important and patients are living longer, we, you know, we play a big role in kind of helping them um, maximize their, their quality of life. Okay, so we kind of broke this up into different stages of ALS, early, middle, and late stage. So just to kind of start with some of the functional difficulties that we see in patients who have early stages of ALS. In limb onset ALS, what we see is just asymmetric weakness in upper and lower body muscles, which can eventually lead to decreased function and mobility. So some of the difficulties that we'll see early on are in particular decreased grip strength and just having a hard time holding on to things, including small items like keys or utensils, toothbrushes, opening jars, those types of things. Our patients often also have fatigue in their upper extremities, mostly in their shoulders in particular, during overhead reaching tasks and grooming and bathing. We also see difficulties with dressing tasks, such as zipping, buttoning, pulling up pants, looping a belt onto pants, as well as mild to moderate muscle fatigue and weakness during their activities of daily living or their ADLs. And generally, just patients are often complaining of and noting decreased energy throughout the day during just about everything. It's just easier to kind of hit a wall and find that they're getting fatigued. Um, some of, even early on, people can experience tightness and decreased joint range of motion that also just makes it harder to do any of their daily living tasks. And again, kind of goes back to that decreased grip strength too. So some things that we will end up recommending to help modify um, or kind of compensate for the deficits that people will have early on are all different types of body positions and environmental modifications, as well as many different types of adaptive equipment. So there are many pieces of equipment out there, and we'll just kind of run through a few together here. But oftentimes, we end up recommending foam tubing or just different utensils and items that have thicker handles so that they're easier for our patients to hang on to when they have decreased grasp strength. Um, we'll also recommend electric shavers or toothbrushes so they can kind of save their energy a little bit during some of those tasks. Uh, we will often recommend finding support through their elbows so that they can kind of reduce that muscle fatigue in their upper arms when they're doing fine motor and tasks with their hands. Um, we do a lot of training and energy conservation for basically all of our patients, just kind of ways to budget their energy throughout the day so that they can better pace themselves from morning until evening and not, again, kind of hit a wall quite as quickly. We are also recommending many other types of equipment such as shower chairs or tub benches, raised or elevated toilet seats, transport wheelchairs, portable bed rails, again, many, many pieces of equipment. And early on, we are very, very big on fall prevention, really at any stage, but in particular in the beginning. And we are often recommending outpatient services, in particular outpatient PT to help recommend adaptive devices like a cane or a walker, as well as just give balance and gait intervention. And then in addition, we're recommending just different types of equipment to help keep them safe and reduce fall risks, such as grab bars or elevated seat heights, um, sitting on higher surfaces so it's less effortful to get up and down and just kind of reducing fall risk that way. And then we are also often recommending home occupational and physical therapy just to make sure that their, their space is safe for them to do their self-care and their mobility at home. So this is a picture of, or many pictures of different types of equipment. So in the top left, you see um, just a version of one of those bed rails that I talked about, just makes it easier for patients to get up to the edge of the bed. Um, and the bottom left is an example of a, a, um, a lift cushion. But there are also lift chairs that are kind of bigger recliners that will help people to stand to kind of compensate from some um, decreased leg strength. Also a toilet safety frame in the bottom and the middle. Um, and on the right side are different pieces of equipment that help with some of that decreased grasp strength. Like in the middle, we see the, some foam handles or built up handles. On the top right is a universal cuff or a U-cuff, which is helpful to kind of slide into people's hands and be able to insert a utensil or an iPad stylus, something like this. 
and there are all the different types of equipment that can be helpful for meal preparation and eating, such as the rocker knife in the bottom right that just kind of makes it easier to hang on to the knife. Oh, and that's a button hook too, in the, that like middle on the left. It's kind of a silly looking device that can be really helpful for people to loop their buttons closed. Um, another really important piece of what we're helping with in the early stages is recommending stretching and, and range of motion exercise programs for people. So that's really helpful in preventing contractures, is decreasing pain and tightness that people might experience, as well as facilitating good posture to make sure that people are also um, increasing their breathing efficiency. It's also very important for our patients to keep doing light cardio as tolerated. It's just really important to find a good balance with this. It's helpful for our patients to engage in moderate intensity exercise, but we wanna make sure that they are also, again, kind of monitoring themselves and not doing too much because high intensity exercise can actually be counterproductive. We don't want people to be damaging already weak muscles. So it's just about finding that good balance. So oftentimes what we're telling our patients is just to see how they feel afterward. They shouldn't really feel very exhausted for more than around 30 minutes or something after exercise. And if they are, they're very tired. Um, it's impacting their ability to do their day-to-day -day tasks. That's a sign that they've done too much. And then we need to kind of go back and um, adjust that exercise program and bring it down a little bit to find a better kind of just right challenge for them. So at any stage, and again, it's particularly in the early stages, we're educating our patients on all kinds of just home and workplace modifications, different resources in the community, <clears throat> excuse me, and just giving them education about expected disease progression so they kind of know what to plan for in advance. And it's also just so important for us to have our patients be involved in this sort of problem solving process. There are all different kinds of questions that our patients will come in with. Um, so it's very important for them to be involved in finding the solutions to those problems so that they have a buy-in into the different types of modifications and equipment that we recommend. And we really encourage them to be a part of that process with us. Oh, this too, okay. So this is just an example of <laughs> um, different range of motion exercises that we'll recommend for patients. It's kind of a busy looking slide, but just gives that gist of the idea that we really want people to be proactive about their stretching programs. Um, just to prevent some of those contractures and tightness. So we're either recommending that the patients themselves do these exercises or if they don't necessarily have the strength and ability to do all these things, we're recommending caregivers and family members as well to um, kind of showing them how to help out with some, some of these exercises to facilitate success. Okay, so moving on to the middle stages. Um, so with some functional difficulties that we'll commonly see are, you know, we've already provided a lot of adaptive equipment and education. Um, the patients might come in and they still have, you know, a lot of difficulty with transfers despite kind of continued use of um, like chair arm rests um, and other pieces of adaptive equipment, or they'll have increased difficulty with functional mobility, um, which may lead to an increased number of falls. And so they also might have a loss of range of motion, you know, when their muscles are getting weaker and weaker and they're not moving their, um, their, their muscles or their joints can also lead to kind of pain with that prolonged joint immobility. And so some recommendations that we'll commonly, you know, provide for our patients and their families that are caregivers that come in with us are uh, extensive patient and caregiver education on, you know, proper transfer training um, and techniques. So whether that's kind of having um, a demonstration, if the caregiver kind of comes into the clinic with them, kind of having them show us what they're doing, what's working well, if they're needing more assistance, kind of just making sure that they have that, those proper body mechanics. Um, or kind of what the next point is increasing supportive devices. So maybe because of those increased falls, recommending um, like a four-wheeled walker where they're able to kind of keep their independence, but they're able to sit and take a break on the seat um, so they're not getting too fatigued, um, but have that option. And so one of our role is also to begin the power wheelchair discussion and the ordering process, because as we all know, it takes a long time to kind of order and get that ball rolling. Um, so we wanna, especially if someone's coming in with increased falls, we wanna you know, get that bug in their ear and just, you know, make sure that they're aware that likely will want to make sure they're safe and have that option for when they may need it. Um, so we'll also kind of recommend shoulder sleeves 
that help minimize shoulder pain and subluxation, um, as well as a ton of different um, orthotics, AFOs, resting hand splints, um, thumb opponents and thumb opposing slint, splints and um, like cervical collars due to that muscle weakness. Um, and again, we wanna have sustained muscle, muscle stretches and proper positioning, especially for nighttime to help prevent <coughs> contractures. So um, neutral positioning for splinting with like resting hand splints or prefos, um, kind of just problem solving and making sure that they are you know, in a good position for when they're sleeping and moving around. Um, so here is some of kind of what I was talking about, the, the opponent's splints. So they have, you know, functional use of their thumb when their muscle is getting weaker. Um, or the resting hand splint in the bottom left for preventing contractures and maintaining a neutral position for um, at night times so they're not getting contracted or pain. Um, the AFO to help with someone's experiencing foot drop, um, and then a figure eight brace as well, kind of like Sophia was talking about for good posture, for breathing. Um, and a lot of times, you know, patients might have weak neck muscles, so kind of recommending a servo collar when appropriate um, in various, various kinds with that. And like I talked about, the four-wheeled walker um, for being able to sit and rest and kind of regain some of that energy so we're helping to prevent those falls. My name is Arielle. I'm going to talk about the later stages of ALS. Um, so because at this point, patients are less able or not at all able to take care of themselves and complete their functional mobility or ADL tasks, the paradigm that we use to provide advice kind of switches. It's a different rehab mindset um, than we're using at the early and the middle stages. Um, so there are some, obviously, a lot of functional dif um, difficulties, full dependence on others for transfers, mobility, self-care, Minimal to no function in all extremities. <clears throat> High risk for joint contractures, skin breakdown, muscle and joint pain. So that is a really crucial point, that third one there, that we really focus on a lot um, in these final stages. And I'll talk more about, excuse me, about that. Um, and also caregiver fatigue due to the physical and emotional demands of full-time care, which, as you know, is, it's a lot. Um, and sometimes it's kind of a sensitive topic. Obviously, people... The families want to show their love, but also they there's some boundaries that need to be set. So we sometimes help people problem solve through that. And what might that look like? How can we find some creative solutions um, to make sure that everybody's needs are being met at this point? <clears throat> so the recommendations that we make um, are more around caregivers um, and how to dependently help people and also about range of motion. So we talk a lot about lifts and Hoyer lifts and helping them make that transition we don't have the lifts here in the clinic, but we do talk through it and help them understand what's the purpose, when might you use it, when's a good time to transition, um, and then some basic education. A lot of times we'll have them follow up with a home therapist and really try to empower them to say, when the home therapist comes, this is, what I, this is why we consulted you. We need you to teach us this, this, and this. Um, so really trying to empower them to use their home therapist in, to meet what their needs actually are. Um, ADL equipment and positioning techniques. So sometimes that's, you know, different equipment that might make it easier for the caregivers rather than what might, get, might make it easier for the patient. Proper seating and positioning of the power chair. We do have, we work with positioning clinic. Um, but we also, I've gone in and make, made recommendations of, oh, this looks like it might be a little bit breakdown there. You might want to change this. Talk to your wheelchair specialist about this. Um, based on how they're looking and what kind of subjective complaints that they have around their position. Um, education on full body range of motion program, this is a huge one. I talk about this every single time. Even if things are kind of status quo um, since their last visit, and someone who's dependent, I still go in there and I reinforce how important this is because this makes a really big difference in their um, pain and also the ease on the caregiver. So I know it's a little bit of extra work and I say I know I know it's hard to fit it into your routine, but it's an investment, so this is really important. Sometimes we'll give like a written program or something um, if they don't quite know what they're doing, or sometimes we'll have a home therapist follow up. Uh, caregiver training on pressure sore prevention, that's a really big one. Education on techniques to decrease edema, so that's pretty much massage, compression, elevation, those are kind of the basics. 
Um, and then we encourage family member, members to engage in self-care, hire outside help, all that stuff around caregiver burnout, which is a really big deal um, in people's quality of life. So here's a few examples of some of the equipment that people might be using in the later stages. Um, inflatable bathtubs, um, roll-in showers, um, you know, talking about like supporting their elbow for sublux prevent subluxation when they're in these power chairs, different types of hospital beds or pressure relief mechanisms, different pillows. You can see um, the body pillow is a really popular one. I always just tell them to Google pregnancy pillows, and I have lots of recommendations these days. So, <laughs> um, But there's lots of options, and we work closely with the wheelchair mobility um, specialists in our clinic to, to meet these needs. So, as always, insurance can be a barrier. Um, no surprise there, right? Um, but sometimes they'll limit the amount of therapy that people can get. Um, and we also run into the issue of home therapists not having experience with this type of um, condition, and so they might go in there with goals that are a little bit different than what we think the goals should be. And so we've done a lot of work to really, again, try to empower the patients and the families to express what it is that their needs are and why did we send that consult in. We came up with a handout that says a, a checklist of this is what your home therapist should be going over with you instead of just trying to exercise that's that's not going to do them any good. Um, so we really try to empower them to get their needs met. Um, but sometimes you need to space those visits out because the insurance might limit how many visits they can get in a certain time frame. Insurance does not cover adaptive equipment for fine motor activities or ADL. So a lot of the stuff that they were talking about in the early and middle stages is not covered. It's self-pay. Sometimes there can be like lending closets or I'm always on the hunt for like cheaper options, um, but that is a barrier for people, is sometimes um, cost of all of this equipment, especially if they need something like a bathroom remodel and they, they don't have the money to do that, which most people don't. We have to really think creatively about how can we get this, um, other types of less expensive solutions. Um, different rehabilitation paradigm, like I said earlier, in these later stages were not we're not necessarily focused on how can this patient maintain independence. We're looking more at how can we maintain the quality of life with the function that they have. And we're focusing a lot more on the caregivers, body mechanics, caregiver burnout, and then again, really that range of motion and um, edema. That's, those are big ones. Another big thing is insurance only covers big equipment every five years, like a wheelchair or other big pieces of equipment. So. <coughs> These many people progress at a rate that is, I mean, every five years is not going to meet their needs. So that's an issue too. We work with different, you know, lending closets or less turn or whatever, trying to figure out how can we get them the equipment that they need when insurance is really not um, doing us any favors in that way. <laughs> 